Good morning and welcome to the Mines and Money China Mining Panel. Uh, we have a fantastic group of panelists here to get into all the nitty gritty and all the details of what is the main issues driving in China's mining at the moment. We're going to be looking at a bit of the what's happening in the domestic market, but also what are the Chinese miners looking for internationally? Where do they see the opportunities? What are the problems? What are they seeking most out of uh, their investments at the moment? So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel, and we'll start with George Fang, who is the executive chairman of Zijiang Huawei Cobalt. Um, also joining us is Greg Pan, who is uh, the president and CEO of the Hankang Industrial Group, which I believe do quite a lot in iron, nickel, and, and even some gold. Um, Maggie Huang, who is a general manager uh, of Gold Mountains International Mining, which is the offshore arm of Zijian Mining. And finally, Peter Arkell, who's a chairman of the Global Mining Association of China. And I thought the best way to actually sort of start a panel discussion like this is just to basically go around the panelists, get them to introduce themselves and their companies, and basically talk a little bit about what are they doing at the moment, where are they seeing the opportunities, from just a perspective from how they are looking at uh, the market in which they operate. So I think let's start with George, um, just to see how you can talk to us about what your company is doing and how you're feeling about cobalt. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a good time to see you, ladies and gentlemen, again in the MLS Mining uh, platform. Uh, this is George Fan from Zhejiang Huayu. So uh, I'm very happy sitting together with our uh, friends and ex colleagues, um, Mr. Pan, Greg, and Maggie, especially uh, Peter. Yeah our old friends. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, you know, Zhejiang Huayu Cobalt, uh, it's a high-tech company uh, to focus on research and development and production of uh, cathode materials and precursors. That is uh, for the, for the uh, mat uh, material for the battery EV battery industry. So, uh, but while do the production, R&D and production from the uh, a special, quite unique vertical uh, uh, integrated value chain from very beginning mining to uh, the refinery to precursor to uh, cathode material production. And also we do uh, Battery recycling business as well. So, uh, Huayu's uh, uh, major client in this business uh, is a bat e a batteries uh, produ uh, producer and EV clients. So, uh, our uh, in terms of uh, the battery, we got a two kind of battery uh, client. One is for tenure precursor and tenure uh, cathode materials. That's for UA industry. Another one is cobalt. Uh, cobalt uh, materials, that's for uh, the 3C uh, customers. So that's what we, what we do. And uh, during the past years, for example, one or two years, I already joined my year uh, one and a half year. So during the past one and a half years, what we did is, uh, uh, three things. First thing is we focus on our research and development of cathode materials, EV materials. We are uh, very much uh, want to uh, be a significant supplier uh, of uh, EV materials globally. And second is uh, we improve our capability uh, to uh, provide high quality products and also with uh, reasonable uh, low cost. Uh, the third one is what we did is uh, resources development globally. You know, uh, while uh, mainly focus on uh, uh, EV metals uh, resources development. Nowadays, what we have and what we will do is we've got a corporate and cobalt mining operation in DRC. And uh, nickel and cobalt mining and smelting 
operation in Indonesia, and also lithium uh, resources development activity in both Argentina uh, of South America and DRC. So uh, for that's uh, what we already did. Well, nowadays we got a quite good capacity in terms of nickel, cobalt, copper, and also lithium production uh, is nowadays is on the way. So that's uh, uh, in the future. So I kind of be, kind of say future in the coming three to five years we will enhance our uh, resource development, and uh, marketing development, and also our, our fabricating capacity. In, Mainly, mainly uh, we uh, pay a lot of attention to three things uh, when we do business. First, it's a green uh, uh, policy. Nowadays, the, the, nowadays is the great time for uh, the energy transforming, we say energy revolution. From the uh, original energy, for example, carbon uh, extensive energy, uh, to uh, new energy. During this time, during this uh, years, what we need to do is uh, try, try uh, to be one of the participants to develop our uh, EV battery um, efforts. And second, what we did is pay a lot of attention to uh, carbon emission uh, reduction and uh, towards the, the target of uh, uh, neutralization. And also, uh, yeah, that's the second. The third one is what we did is uh, uh, to pay a lot of attention to ESG to get a better shape of the company it, to be recognized, globally recognized in the uh, industry. Thank you. Thanks, George. It seems very much that your company is extremely well positioned to to sort of uh, participate in the in the energy transition. You know, uh, cobalt, nickel, all the things that you're going to need. I will come back to you to talk about how you look at new investments and and things like that. But I think let's move on to uh, Maggie. Um, again, a very interesting company, uh, very big domestic mining operations and your parent company. I know you look more offshore. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what you're looking at at the moment, uh, what investment opportunities you're seeing. Sure. So uh, my name is Maggie Huang from Big Mining. I'm currently uh, the general uh, manager of uh, Go Mountain International Mining, which is the offshore arm of Big Mining. Um, currently, uh, Zing has has uh, investment projects in 12, 12 different countries outside of China, uh, besides uh, our operations in 14 provinces in uh, within PRC, uh, within China. Um, so uh, the role of Gold Mountain is basically the, the holding and investment company of, uh, arm of the, of the corporate. Um, so Zizi Mining, we focus on uh, three commodity, it's uh, gold, copper, and zinc. And we have uh, some other minerals as well, um, however, not as significant. So with our major com uh, major focus on uh, commodities, uh, we are actually currently by production, the largest uh, gold producer, uh, and largest copper producer, and largest zinc producer in China. Um, the company was founded 20 something years ago, and we were public in Hong Kong uh, in 2003, and we got uh, dual listed in, on Shanghai Stock Exchange in 2008. We currently have a market cap roughly around like um, three, 300 to 400 billion dollars. Um, uh, currently, um, you know, as, as George said, at uh, Zizi Mining, you know, like we also want to be a responsible mining company. So in the current years, we have been making a lot of effort on the um, on ESG. Um, so we are looking to um, to increase our ESG rating, you know, like within two years to to a, to a, you know much higher higher level, and um, and at the same time. Uh, during the past five years, we have acquired um, um, a good number of projects. Like we have acquired ten projects outside of China, and these two years we are putting, we are investing in a lot of capex to 
in order to make these uh, projects into production as soon as possible. Um, within this year, we actually have, like last year, we have a continental gold, which is a Politica in, in Colombia got into production. And this year we have our uh, Galeno Gold Field and also uh, Kamoa uh, got into production. Um, so um, this year we also having, you know, a starting our phase two construction in Kamoa and also, um, you know, I, we just completed our construction in Timok. Uh, so these are what we are doing a very currently uh, besides, you know, all the other things. And in the near future, we, we are still, you know, like uh, quite actively looking for opportunities outside, outside of China as, as we see, you know, like copper as a highly strategic uh, metal for China. We are the largest consumer in the world. We consume half of the output of, of copper. However, we would produce uh, only, you know, 20, 20 to 25% of what we, what we actually uh, use in China. So um, in you know like in the near future that's that's going to continue being uh, uh, our focus. Uh, copper is going to be continue uh, being one of our focus uh, gold as well and you know as well as uh, zinc. Yes, that's a brief introduction. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Maggie. I, th I think it's quite interesting that um, you know, you, you zeroed in on, on what I think is probably the, the most interesting long-term commodity at the moment, which is copper. So I think we'll probably want to talk a little bit about that um, later on in the panel. Um, let's get a slightly different perspective and go to Peter and ask him, you know, as, a, as a, a, a mining association person, how are you viewing the industry at the moment? What are you seeing uh, as the investment opportunities and what are your members telling you? Well, thank you. Clyde and good morning to everybody. Um, perhaps I could tell people first what uh, what GMAC uh, is with the Global Mining Association uh, of China. It's uh, it is the representative body of the uh, the mining community, the broad the broad mining community in China. So it, it is not only miners, but it's also the the Mets and uh, the lawyers and and bankers and uh, uh, even in my case, I I have a. a a headhunting company. So uh, we have a broad scope of, uh, of, of members uh, that are uh, part of GMAC. Uh, and in fact, GMAC changed, has changed over the years. GMAC um, representing that broad sweep of, of companies today is very different to what it was when we first formed. But in those days, it was formed when China was very open to exploration and we had just about every mining company, certainly the, the larger ones and some very small um, mini companies that were doing exploration in China. We had something like 400 projects that were being conducted in China by international companies uh, doing exploration. And today we've got less than a handful. Um, so it's a, it's a much different uh, scene for the international mining community here today. And the companies that are here are either selling material into China or wanting to partner with Chinese companies as they do business here in China and as they as they go abroad. Uh, by the way, if uh, any of the people that are participating in our in our discussion today happen to be visiting China, we, we do meet regularly, uh, usually in Beijing and usually on the second last Thursday of the month. So always visitors are welcome to come and hear and meet people like George and Maggie in person and, uh, and, and learn more from uh, the Chinese side. Um, so you asked me what, they are, uh, what our members uh, are seeing, Clyde. And uh, it's interesting you mentioned copper. Uh, uh, we had a, a discussion only last week from the International Copper Alliance, uh, uh, International Copper Association, beg your pardon, uh, on, on copper and, uh, and it's it's part in the um, in the, the drive towards uh, um, carbon neutral uh, world that, that China is very actively pursuing. Um, so our members are really interested in in that side of things. We've had steel. We've looked at uh, how we can help Chinese companies to to become more productive. How we can help them to be. Um, uh, to be greener, as uh, as George uh, talked about, and 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 ESG. So, 
uh, lots of our companies are interested in partnering with uh, with Chinese companies here in China and and potentially going abroad. And that 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 could be the big companies uh, such as the majors, where we've got a couple of very interesting projects where they're doing some work uh, inside China uh, with with the some large uh, Chinese uh, enterprises and then and some very small ones. And um, it's a it's a vibrant, a vibrant community, um, uh, which is uh, wanting to see more cooperation between between uh, China and and um, the, the global the global industry. I think it's a that's a, that, that was also you raised some very interesting issues as well on um, just how easy it is to do business now, um, and I think we'll we'll have to have a little bit of a chat about. That. But I certainly didn't want to. Uh, leave somebody to last, I'll view it as lucky last, but um, Greg, perhaps you can um, come on board and, and tell us a little bit about what uh, Hanking Industrial Group is doing and, and where you're seeing the opportunities at the moment. Sure. Thank you, Kalat. Hello, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Greg Pan in Hanking Group. I'm very happy uh, to be in this panel and chat a, a little bit of the, uh, the mining uh, industries. Uh, Hanking Group, uh, we uh, you know, established over 30 years ago in Fushun, China. We are a, a, a diversified company. We are engaging in the uh, in mining, steels, in microelectronics, and precision bearing, and also commercial centers. So uh, in the mining sector, we have operating mines in iron ore, gold, nickel, in China, Australia, and Indonesia. We have also explored you know, other regions, you know, other opportunities in South, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, Africa, and also CIM countries. So Hanking uh, has been one of the largest uh, private iron ore mining companies in, the, uh, in Northeast China. We uh, produce very high grade iron ore concentrates with ultra low you know, impurities. Hanking started its international expansions not very, you know, very long ago, just about over a decade ago. We have successfully expanded our businesses into international markets through acquisitions, development, and operations. And uh, we uh, uh, acquired PGO in Australia about three years ago and developed it uh, to a multi-million ounces gold asset in Australia after we successfully completed a cycle of thousand cross gold asset from acquisition, development, operations, and sales. So we own a world-class nickel asset you know, that's the laterite uh, in, uh, in the, nickel, the nickel resource in uh, Indonesia with very large resource base. Uh, we are now working on the uh, construction and metallurgical uh, processing uh, facilities and also, uh, you know, engaging in the uh, green operations. So all in Hanking strategic direction is to continue fo focusing on the mining sector you know, particularly in large metal commodities and metals related to the, uh, you know, EV batteries. You know, Hanking also continue to seek acquisitions opportunities in outside of China. And we also try to grow our businesses in very good jurisdiction regions. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Um, it seems, you know, so far we've got uh, a, a, a quite a common theme coming out from from our, our, our mining companies here is you're all looking still to do quite a lot of investment and in business overseas. So I'll go back to George. I mean, you your company operates in probably one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, jurisdictions in the world. And I'm talking about the Congo. I mean, that must be incredibly difficult. But still, you know, yourself and a couple of other companies like Glencore have have. have I've put a lot of effort and a lot of investment into working in what is an extremely challenging environment. Um, is this because you really need that resource and that's where the resources are and you will go where the resources are and deal with the other problems? Or I mean, what, what you're thinking, how, how do you actually get to the point of saying, we're going to put a lot of money into a country that is fundamentally, um, how can I put this, a, a challenging place to be? 
Um, how do you how do you get around that? Thank you, thank you. Very good question. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, say a few points. Uh, first, we don't see DRC is a really difficult country. You know, for mining operation, no easy country. Almost. Do you think Australia is easy? United States is easy. Canada is easy. Actually, but life is easy. Mining operation is not easy. So in that case, DRC is good to uh, the mining operation. We believe not only we, uh, not only Hua Yu, but also I believe the GG Money Maggie may, maybe show me at the same view. And also uh, uh, we got uh, some uh, uh, friends and, uh, and partners, for example, Golan Ko, and uh, even uh, uh, originally we uh, uh, have uh, a free foot. Uh, nowadays, it's changed to China Mori. So, uh, DRC have their own uh, situation, pros and cons. And uh, for the, uh, in the advantage point, DRC have three advantages, it's a very important advantage for Chinese companies. First is Chinese standards can be used in DRC. If we set up operation in North America or Europe or some other country, even in Central Asia, we need to change our Chinese standardized to the local standards. Last painful, you know, money and time. So this is uh, the uh, first advantage. Second, in DRC, we have very uh, interesting feeling. Uh, we believe, uh, even with DRC guys speak French and, and English, some of the guys can speak part of Chinese, uh, but spiritually, we believe that we feel it would be easy to understand between the people. Sometimes, the, I would, we don't know, of course, the cultural difference is still there, but we get a little bit easy to understand each other as a culturally. This, uh, and also in that case, when, when, we, when our people pay a lot of attention in the, uh, the ESG, for example, environmental issues, social issues, and governance issues, that make us not so much difficult to, to run in, in a good shape in, a, in, a, in, a, in a international standardized and get acceptance from a local uh, community and so, social society. And also DRC government, uh, the central government, both central government and the provincial government is quite supportive to our operations. For example, during the uh, uh, what we see at the pandemic, the uh, uh, COVID-19, DRC, uh, those guys, uh, it's, uh, it's quite, make a, a lot of efforts. So that's uh, second, we believe, uh, the advantage. The third one is uh, when we do business in DRC, uh, the legal system, for example, mining law, and also uh, the uh, uh, regulation system, it's quite uh, transparent and also uh, uh, easy to uh, communicate. When we see some things, we communicate with uh, the institutions and also our government. We 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 were working together to reach the point. So that's good uh, advantage. What we did in DRC, uh, of course, there are some uh, uh, things we need for our efforts to overcome. For example, uh, the uh, local things uh, related to. Uh, the stability. So I would do uh, uh, that's that seems where we believe uh, uh, we need to try something to overcome. Also, the cost is uh, getting increasing, but reasonably okay. okay thank you, George. So, uh, yeah. That's uh, what we think about DRC. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, it's interesting that you actually have, have, have quite a positive view about it. And you, know, you sort of mentioned that there's challenges to operate in any jurisdiction. And I, and I guess that is certainly true. Um, I, I would like to come back to Maggie, because uh, I know that her company has looked at uh, investments, particularly in Canada. But um, the other thing is, uh, and I really don't want you to talk about politics on this, but it's, it's a, it's a well-known case that um, the Canadian government, as well as the Australian government, are currently in disputes with the Chinese government. Um, I'm not going to go into the where's and why's and how's of that, but does that make life any more difficult? Um, I mean, are, are you still looking at doing acquisitions or building your business in countries like Canada, or would this dispute be something that you would, would, would cause you to, to walk away? Thank you. Well, I guess at the moment, uh, um, um, no, uh, because like Canada and Australia ha have always been, you know, this like most mature mining markets. And I guess like for Chinese company, we have, we have like sort of learned our lesson, but it's not, you know, on the, on the political side. Um, you know, during 2007 to 2012, that many mining, many Chinese mining companies have done investment like tracing projects in, in either Canada or Australia for the for the you know uh, for this like very mature mining markets and 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 stable uh, environment and and all that. However, investment it's an investment. So in the end of the day, you have to look at your return of investment. So I, uh, in recent years, we have like gradually moved into like uh, other regions. I guess now, like for example, uh, you just mentioned DRC, but I, I guess like the whole um, Africa or South America, like these continents, they are very rich in mineralizations, and um, and after all, like, you know, it, it might be better investment for for many companies. And I'll just stay with you there, Maggie. Where do you see the, the, the most attractive um, prospects at the moment? I mean, not, not, not necessarily country specific, but what, what, what um, minerals do you think are, are the ones that uh, are going to have offer the best long term returns? I mean, I, mean I, I know we've talked about copper. I think gold is probably still something that's on your radar screen, but is there something else that, 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 that uh, um, interests your company? Well, um, for our company, we our our main focus, like we concentrate on something uh, that we would consider a strategic uh, commodity for 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 China because we know the Chinese market really well, and as a Chinese company ourselves, like you know, like um, being able to secure the supply of this kind of like strategic um, uh, commodities, it's also a way to. To ensure the long-term development of the, of the company itself, because after all, the Chinese market is, is pretty large already. And Indeed. so, yes, I, I I guess like in um, like specifically which commodity we do what we know the best of, like at the moment, which is gold, copper, and zinc, and um, we. We think copper, uh, gold, and copper both are going to be very promising. And um, although, although you know, like um, recently the price have, have you know have decreased a bit, but uh, overall we think the fundamental have not changed, and we still think it's a it's, it's a very good metal to invest in. Thanks, Maggie. Uh, perhaps I'll come back to Greg and ask him a similar sort of question. Uh, where do you see the best opportunities at the moment? We, we, you know, obviously you have uh, you have limited amount of uh, money available for investment, so you're obviously going to target uh, the, the best what you see as the best prospects. So, what kind of um, commodities are you looking at? And if do you have a, a country or a regional preference in in or do you prefer just to look at the the resource base and and target the best resources irrespective of where they are. Yes, Claude. Um, you know, Hanqing as I just uh, you know uh, introduced our company. Uh, we are working with iron ore, uh, gold, and nickel as its you know point. And uh, from the largest single commodity, uh, you know, major commodity uh, industry-wise, 
iron ore is still very important uh, in the mineral that uh, we are, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, you know, in like very much. And, you know, we, we, we continue to, to, to look for that opportunity. And also by the a single most hot or important industry uh, in minerals, you know, copper. You know, that, so, so even, you know, we don't have copper now, but we continue, you know, we also, you know, look for that opportunity too. You know, but from the future, you know, particularly next decade or more, you know, obviously that nickel also very, very critical mineral, which is, is also very hot mineral in the last few years. And that will continue for the next decade. And particularly with this EV industry and, um, and other, you know, green uh, industries in grow and also the carbonate, uh, you know, issues. Uh, you know, international communities are paying more and more attention to it. So I would say that nickel is very, you know, very important uh, in metal too. So Han King will continue to search opportunities of iron, you uh, know, gold and, and copper and uh, nickel. And at the same time, you know, as a matter of fact, we also look for some, you know, uh, you know graphite. And which also a very important part of the battery in materials too. And also investments is not really that big. You know, usually capex is not, is not uh, you know, that intensive. So, uh, you know, overall, you know, I see that uh, as a mining, uh, you know, in the mining, you know, uh, you know, in over 30 years, I really feel that uh, the mining economy should be diversified. Uh, into metals, yeah, I, I think you shouldn't focus in, in just the in single metal because every metal has a cycle, and I think you need to uh, to offset or you know to to you know somehow you you know you you mitigate you know you know kind of bad times for for certain metals, you know by diversify you know you know that you know uh, you know you build up the uh, you know uh, in port in portfolio for the you know several metals. So, so you know that's uh, in, in pretty much our view. You know, uh, you know, we, you know, you know. I think we try to to uh, to continue to search this, uh, you know, opportunities. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Um, Peter, as as someone who probably talks to to, to more mining companies than, than than most people would, um, where are you? What is the sort of message that you get? Where, where are people wanting to put their money? Where, where is the, the 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 next big thing? Or are we just really sticking with the idea that we're having this energy transition and all the things related to that. So your copper, your nickel, your cobalt, your lithium, and a few others, that's where we're going and, and that's it. Well, I, I wish I was as uh, wise about where the next big things are going to be, uh, as you might have indicated, Greg, uh, Clyde. I'm, uh, I don't know whether I'm as good as that. I do remember uh, that we had uh, the privilege of having uh, George uh, giving us a talk at a GMAC meeting a couple of months ago. And George declared that nickel was the new gold, uh, which was something that, uh, that struck me as being uh, something that a wise person with George's experience is, uh, is something that needs to be taken note of. Um, and I think Greg's right about uh, iron ore. The, the, um, the, the Chinese uh, demand for steel is, is continuing to be enormous. And with um, you know, the, the particular um, you know, surge in the price of iron ore at the moment is, is meaning that you know, the development of West Africa will, will, will happen, you know, something that's been sort of been on, uh, on a slower track than it had been before. There's certainly a lot more interest both here uh, amongst some Chinese uh, companies, but also with uh, foreign companies that are wanting to find Chinese partners to do things. So one interesting um, thing that um, I've observed, Clyde, was that um, uh, Western companies now are very interested in, in, in the mining practices of, uh, of the Chinese. You know, how do Chinese develop, develop mines and, and to learn there's this tendency to think that the Chinese want to learn from the from the, the Western companies, the large international companies, and learn their practices. But there are now companies wanting to find out how Chinese develop mines and how they 
how they can get things to uh, to production much more quickly than what uh, uh, their processes have seen them come into production. I think that's a, a really interesting trend. You know, to see to see transfer of, of technologies and and capability between uh, between the two different uh, mining industries or mining communities is um, something I think is going to be benefiting to the to the to the industry and that I, I just think that uh, you know there's still a lack of appreciation in the West for those that, that aren't uh, are well connected into China of what the capability is here that and you know for those companies that have woken up to it and are now now investigating the ways that they can partner uh, will find a, not only um, you know that they're willing to be partners in a in a uh, an investment sense, but also in technology and, and mining practices. And I think that'll be beneficial for, for those that look down that pathway. Indeed, I think uh, quite often, particularly people in the West, forget that China's a, a very major mining country in itself. You know, biggest yeah. coal miner, biggest gold miner, for example, and a miner of massive amounts of commodities. We just tend to see them as a, a buyer of commodities, which, which indeed they are. But we forget they're also a major producer. We are actually getting a couple of uh, questions from the audience. So uh, there is one for George. Um, could you please give us some update on your HPAL project in Indonesia? When will that project likely start? That's that's the straight question, George. I, I haven't editorialized that as well. OK, thank you. So uh, nowadays we have uh, two H uh, HPL, we, we call it HPAL uh, project is going on. First one is a Huayue project. Uh, Huayue uh, uh, project, the major shareholder, the Huayue is 50, 57 uh, fifty-seven percent where majority control. But at the same time, we got partner uh, from Qinsan uh, Group and also a uh, China Moli. So that's uh, uh, the capacity of Huawei uh, nowadays. Uh, that's designed sixty thousand pounds nickel content uh, in the uh, uh, products. The products is a uh, nickel cobalt. Uh, hydroxide. So at the same time, the uh, cobalt content in the products is around whatever, 7,000 to 8,000 pounds a year. So uh, nowadays we are in the uh, final stage of uh, construction. The major uh, construction all nowadays is uh, almost done. So uh, some equipment will be start to uh, uh, single equipment uh, running and commissioning in the September, October, we will start our commissioning, finish all the construction, start commissioning end of this year. So uh, after uh, the commissioning and also clean up, we, we, we will spend somewhere around half to one year we put into production, get the normal, uh, get the, the normal operations. So uh, according to current, what we did, uh, we are very much confident to say to the market, uh, the capex is lower than the original design. The original design is 1.2, uh, around 1.2 to 1.3 billion, but lower than that one, and also, uh, uh, because of COVID-19, so we uh, finished our construction, start commissioning end of this year. If do not have a COVID-19, we can be half a year earlier. But nowadays, we are confident we'll put into uh, commissioning end of this year. And uh, uh, this uh, in the construction side, in the technique and operation side, we are already get people ready to train in the people and also uh, from both our existing operation in Chuzhou, we are uh, in Chuzhou, we get an HPR operation already during the past 10 years. And also uh, get people from other sourcing as well, get people ready, get technical guy ready and uh, to start our production. 
we will we are get ready. So uh, in that case, we are quite confident we get a successful operation in the uh, HPAR project. This is uh, Huawei. And the second project, we already make an announcement. So uh, a few uh, months ago, during that time, I spent two months in Indonesia uh, for, uh, for various nickel projects. Uh, and uh, that one already, uh, in nowadays, in the starting stage of uh, uh, engineering and the construction. That one uh, is uh, in the, uh, we, we call it a small key island. So uh, that project, nowadays, we, we the major shareholders, uh, we got three guys to be a partner. One is uh, the Qin Shan uh, to be our partner. And also we've got a one battery producer to be our partner as well. So we're working together to get a, to get a project start construction. The financing is ready. And also uh, the capacity of that HPAR project is around 120,000 pounds. That's a double the size of Huawei. We we'll call it a Huawei. So nowadays it's going on. Uh, the major nickel resources, for the Huawei, it's from a uh, uh, Sulawesi uh, area. And for the uh, Huafei, uh, it's from uh, our Weta Bay area. So at the same time, uh, we, we got a very good opportunity to meet with uh, our uh, the friends and team from uh, Hang King, from Greg. We, uh, we, today, we see your face. We got very much happy. We want to see you face to face. Now I'm in the quarantine uh, in the hotel. When I get out, get out to the hotel, I will try to find opportunity to see you there. So that's uh, for uh, the uh, uh, HPAR project. So uh, nowadays we are, we are quite positive and uh, have a good shape of the progress. Thank you. Thanks very much, George. Um... We've only got a few minutes left. There is, a, there is a question that's come in on what is China's policy on coal? Um, how much is it really weaning itself off thermal coal? And why are they still effectively building more coal-fired power plants? Um, funnily enough, I actually look quite a lot of coal in, in the course of what I write about. And it seems to me that the policy seems to be that they're going to keep coal uh, going, uh, growing coal consumption probably up to about 2030. And then the plan is for it to, to lower uh, from that point on. But I thought of a question I could ask anybody on the panel who's willing to take it is, is there any interest in coal um, as an investment perspective, or is that just a, we don't touch that anymore? Anybody? Well, yeah. Clyde, uh, you know, just to say a few words here. Uh, coal, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I don't think uh, that uh, is really it's something that we are going to touch, uh, you know, particularly China that uh, these days, uh, you know, China has uh, very determined to be, you know, to, to reach peak in carbon uh, in emission in 2035, and then the neutralize 2060. So they're working very hard on the cutting the, uh, the carbon emission. So, you know, China going to be very tough you know, in terms of in, in the using of coals to, to generate energies. So, um, you know, in as a mining company uh, for the long term, you know, growth prospect, I think coal is not going to be something that uh, we are going to be focused on. Um, uh, Thank you. Maggie, any comments on coal from your end? Well, I think you know, like coal, coal, coal is probably still, still, uh, still would be quite okay. Um, however, it has never been been the focus for the zinc mining, so uh, I don't think you know we're going to have that as a focus in the near future. Thank you, Peter. Any uh, people talking coal to you? Uh... Not in terms of uh, looking at investment uh, internationally, Clyde. It's uh, it's certainly one. I don't think that would be encouraged, uh, and you know, you'd have to make a pretty good case to be uh, uh, to be making investment abroad. Um, and there's also the domestic uh, coal producers here who uh, uh, 
that that's an industry which is also needing to be to be wound back a little. So I think there's you know, politically, it's you know, to invest internationally in coal would be pretty insensitive. You know, coal is an important mix in the in the in the power uh, important component in the, in the power mix here, uh, and you know, there is uh, a lot of work done on on technology to you know to make the coal uh, less carbon intensive but uh, you know i think international investment would be really really tough to get an approval to make that sort of uh, deal well thank you very much i think um we, we've kind of reached the end of of, of the the time allotted for this panel so um unfortunately I, I i would like to carry on i think we could probably talk all morning um but uh, we have to leave it at that. So I'd really like to thank all the panelists um, for, for joining us and sharing their insights. I think it's been a fantastic uh, opportunity to, to hear from them. Uh, so George, Maggie, Greg, and Peter, thank you very much. And uh, good luck with all your endeavors. Thank you, Clive. Thank you so much. Thank you, Greg, Maggie, and Peter. See you all, uh, next time. Thank time. you, everybody.